All right. Feels like everybody can hear me because I can hear myself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining our session today. We're going to be here today, as you can see, to talk about how to build a FinOps practice and get the most out of your cloud spend within your organization. Now, the most important slide is this one. It shows us. Um, I see a few familiar faces in the crowd here, but for those that don't know me, my name is Eugene Kovastov. I'm Vice President of Product Engineering at Aptio. And prior to this, I actually spent some time at AWS building some of the cost management tools here. So I'm joined by Ashley and Jen today, two amazing, incredible women who have joined us today. Jen will talk to you a bit about FinOps, what it is, why it's important, and give you some of the tips and tricks uh, that we've gotten from the community. It's an excellent community. I'll give you a little information about that. Then Ashley will come up and talk to you about how she has led the development of the FinOps practice in her organization and all the great success they've had, and not just what they're doing, but also the journey of how they got to where they are today. So with that, I will pass it to Jen and get off the stage. There you go. Wait, do I need this? Yes, thank you. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about the FinOps Foundation. The FinOps Foundation was, is a project of the Linux Foundation itself. And our purpose is to advance the people and the, the culture of cloud financial management and to learn to operate efficiently in the new cloud economy. As cloud adoption increases, it is associated costs start to become material to all of our different organizations. And for most, cloud usage will continue to increase over the next several years. We learned yesterday that only 5 to 10% of IT is now operating in the cloud. So now is the right time for each of your organizations to learn about good cloud financial management. In addition, in this economic uncertainty, the ability to manage costs and, if necessarily, drastically reduce your cost becomes vital to companies who are struggling who are struggling economically or who want to take a competitive advantages. Yesterday, we actually learned a great study about United Airlines and how they needed to drastically reduce costs in their environment because of how the pandemic has ravished the airline industry. We can all agree that cloud is critical to every business that um, to our organizations by giving unprecedented access to the technology that drives efficiency and innovation. But there are new complicating factors about the cloud and the reality of the cloud economy. First, we have decentralized procurement. Traditionally, procurement happened in silos within an organization, but now every developer who has access to a keyboard has the opportunity to commit your company to spend. This can be downright frightening to finance and um, procurement organizations, as they no longer have control over how much money is being spent in the cloud, and the processes that they have used to control budget are no longer valid. Add to that that the cloud is variable. Every month, every minute, I apologize, but I just went forward. Every month, every My apologies, everyone. Add to that that the, the variable cloud spend. So every month, every, mo every day, every minute, you could actually have variable spend, right? Even some services every second. And there are over a million SKUs for cloud services. This complexity makes it very difficult to predict f and forecast budget and spending which again means that your internal controls on how companies look and manage their budgets are no longer valid. And then we have instant access to resources that enables innovations, but it also leads to inefficiency and ineffective use of resources, as there's very little controls about how people can actually um, start up and utilize the resources. So the real question from an IT organization is do you have the management techniques to be able to control your resource utilization and your um, consumption of resources in the cloud. Most IT organizations don't have this muscle. They have never had to develop this muscle 
on, in on-premise data centers because it was always done by their procurement teams. And so cloud becomes really financially important. Um, cloud cost optimization becomes very um, important um, in for companies in order to deliver on good products and services. But luckily, there's also a new operating model, right, for the cloud to help address these realities and unlock the opportunities to drive efficiency and to use the transparency of near real-time data to drive decisions, to use to improve and are your products and services. So FinOps is the answer, right? It is an involving cloud financial management discipline and cultural practices that enables organizations to get maximum business value by helping technology, finance, and business teams to collaborate in data-driven decisions. This aligns the whole organization to come together and focus on what is important in actually order to drive business value and not just IT costs. FinOps is a flywheel, so we think of it in three different phases. It's about taking small steps that go through and mature each other and that generate the energy for you to continue to mature your organization. The first phase of it is the inform phase. You start your journey by understanding your cloud span, structuring your accounts, tagging and costs in order to gain meaningful visibility and allocation of your costs. The key to this is that you bring spend to your teams that are meaningful for them and have a good discussion about value. Next, you move in the optimization phase. Once you understand your costs and have it aligned to something that is meaningful for your organization, you look to empower both your financial and your ITI organizations to identify and measure efficiency and optimization opportunities. Then make goal-based decisions on those opportunities. Now there are, a million, there are hundreds of different opportunities for cloud optimization. There are things like reserved instance purchases or savings plans which will give you almost immediate and significant discounts on, on highly used services. But there's also things like we learned about over the last two days. If we think about the Graviton 3 processor that just came out with the new C7, um, G7 services. If we think about the 475 different um, options for compute, all of those give you different options to become highly efficient and effective with your compute. It's not about selecting one, it's about selecting the best service for, for your organization. We also just learned about the near real, the instant um, glacier uh, storage option that was just released also. This goes ahead and takes another opportunity for you to utilize a different service in order for it to you to reduce your costs. Amazon has actually reduced costs several thousand times by offering either a new service with a new capability that allows you differentiation or by actually offering the, a better version of service at a different, at a reduced rate, which was what we saw with the G3. So there are many different ways that you can actually optimize and sometimes this feels very overwhelming to an organization. And this is where we, we start to talk about the key to this is to start small and to start somewhere to choose a place, use the data to figure out where you're spending the most money and that you could have the most type of opportunity. FinOps is always talks about leading with the data. We have access to great amount of data on usage and cost that comes in through the, the cloud service providers. You will be utilizing that to help you identify what are these different opportunities that you should be using. And then you go into the operate phase. Operate is where you take the idea, the optimization opportunity, and you actually execute it on it. And you use data-driven results to measure whether or not you are saving, um, saving with the, oppor the, the opportunity. And then you start this flywheel all over again. Operate is also where you do things like financial controls and policies and processes that need to be put into place or that need to be renegotiated based on the variable nature of the cloud. So where do you start? When we think about the culture shift that is happening with cloud, it affects almost every part of your organization, right? We think about going from the centralized procurement to being, de to being decentralized. We think about going from variable 
to or from fixed to variable spend, and then we think about going to an unlimited access of resources. There are a lot of different parts of your organization that are going to be impacted. And so we highlight that there are four personas that are usually included in your, your FinOps team. The first is the executives, making sure you understand what it is that the executives actually need to do in order to demonstrate fiduciary control. Business and product owners in order for them to actually bring the value of the product and service that they are being developed. Because this isn't about spend, it is about value to the company. And then finance and procurement will all need to know how it is that are we going to forecast that we're going to budget and that we're going to address the variable nature of the spend that is coming in. And then the engineering and operations organizations, which will go through and um, identify what activity and actions actually need to be able in place in order to reduce it. We have six principles that we would like you to apply for your FinOps um, group. First, teams need to collaborate. Those four personas need to collaborate and ensure that they are delivering on a unified approach to, um, to your FinOps. Business value drives decision. IT's purpose is for business value. And so we think of cost, we think of speed, we think of performance every time that we bring an opportunity for a cloud cost optimization. Everyone takes ownership for their cloud usage. So right now, when we look at the procurement model and how it becomes decentralized, the IT organizations actually become responsible for their cloud usage and their cost. And you have to bring that to them. And so it's really important. And this is a muscle that needs to be built within each of the different organizations. You need to make FinOps reports accessible and timely. Amazing amounts of information is coming to you every day. In fact, now most cloud providers do it multiple times in a day. You can use this near real-time information in order to make decisions and take actions if you get it into the hands of the right people or into the right processes. A centralized team drives FinOps. Those four personas need to be working together. And they could have worked together from different parts of the, your enterprise, but they should be working together. And then again, take advantage of the variable cost model of the cloud. If you're not scaling, if you're not shrinking, if you're not deleting resources, you are not optimizing your cloud spend. So what does success look like? So success can be achieved by working collectively to unleash the value of the cloud. Our goals and practices help break down the silos between different parts of the organization in ways that bring predictability to cloud spend. And when you get better and mature, you can get unit-based economics, which is really the nirvana for both of the finance organizations and the IT organizations. And you can then utilize your cloud spend data in order to accelerate innovation and lower the cost of failure. So in just a few minutes, we're going to hear from Ashley and, and understand how she has applied FinOps to Pearson's framework in order to optimize the cloud spend. Ashley and I are part of the 4,400 FinOps practitioners community and developers, and we contribute standards, best practices, and provide directed learning and certification for professional advancement. There is ample opportunity for each of you to learn from the community, to participate in the community, and even to lead in the community. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Aptio, who has been a key supporter of the FinOps Foundation since its inception, um, and so we, we appreciate it. Thank you, Aptio. And now, please welcome Ashley Hermato. everyone. I felt like I needed like dance music coming up here. All right, my name is Ashley Romacco. Um, I am the director of FinOps at Pearson. Now, many of you maybe have heard of Pearson as a textbook company or even taking your certification on one of our platforms. Um, we are the world leading learning company. We focus on delivering high quality content and learning experiences, whether that's through assessments or qualifications. Another fun fact, we're one of Amazon's largest customers. How do you do that? Well, we run about 21,000 instances a day. Um, we have over 300 applications running and hosted, and we've actually closed down nearly 93 data centers in the last 10 years or so. Um, the 3,000 applications, that, or 300 applications that we run, they represent over $3 billion in annual revenue. We also have around 2,000 cloud users, whether that's our SRE teams, our CISO teams, or our development teams. 
Um, we've brought in the last three years of this concept of FinOps uh, and built a global practice around it. And some of the accomplishments that we've had have been financial, um, but really the big accomplishment is the cultural shift that we've drove in here. So we run about a 95 to 99% savings plan coverage with 100% utilization. We forecast at about 8% accuracy. You might hear that number and think, is that good or bad? It's pretty good. It's in the running stays when you think about how difficult it is to really forecast variable spend. Um, the big number, you know, in the last 15 or the last three years, we've been able to save Pearson $15 million by having a FinOps practice. And we'll go into next year with a 100% allocation method created, charging back to each of our product teams. Let me take you a little bit back through our journey because we didn't just get there overnight. Um, so in the early 2000s was a big peak of innovation for Pearson. We launched most of our online products. Many of them are serving millions of learners today. As we launched those products and we were in high innovation, we started to have periods of snags with our data centers. You probably can relate to a lot of this uh, capacity limits, not agile enough, heavy procurement costs, being the testing industry. We needed to have servers ready when we had students testing um, on one day a year, but we didn't need the rest of it the rest of the year, right? So our services got a little uh, fragile. And so by 2014, we developed that we needed application teams around our products. And we went full customer centric with these application teams. And 20, 12, it was very evident we needed to leave to the cloud. It was going to be the only way we were going to be able to scale and transform our products. And so we began that journey. And at that time, we decided we needed to embed our dev teams with our operation teams and embrace the DevOps culture. By 2016, we were fully embracing the cloud, and the proof was really positive for our customers. However, we had some work to do on the back end. We really needed to transform our talent, and maybe this is relatable to you as well, where you've got DBA, system admins, um, but we need to get into that cloud mindset. Um, you know, started with a lot of the lift and shift, but moving to more lift and transform. So we focused a heavy amount of time on um, upskilling our own uh, staff. So I talk about being a lifelong learner, it was time for Pearson to be a lifelong learner. The other thing that we noticed is um, when we did this, we were able to create pods of SRE teams but they needed a little bit of help. So we brought in this concept of foundation teams. And these foundation teams are really there to service these SRE teams so they could figure out how well they're doing on their maturity of their, um, their products. Some of those foundation teams, which I'm one of them, um, like an observability team focusing on a monitoring strategy, or a release engineering team with a CICD framework. We also have a service insights team that does scorecarding, well-architected reviews, and FinOps was born to focus on the financial accountability side of things. Today, not only are we ready to scale, ready to perform, but I think most importantly, we have a world-class engineering talent with a culture of caring about performance, speed, and cost. But again, that wasn't easy to get there. So we faced a lot of struggles. Um, we had siloed engineer teams. We weren't really able to scale our chargeback, and if we did provide chargeback data, it was too late. It was quarterly, end of the year. We even didn't have a very good structure around master payers, so we'd have stuff sitting on credit cards. Someone would leave the company. We didn't know who that account was associated with, and we were growing so quickly that we were expanding multi-cloud in SaaS without those foundation teams, so we knew it was critical to get them in place. And as you can imagine, our finance team saw the boom, or what we call the tipping point, of cloud really wasn't doing much, and now we're investing a lot in it, and they wanted us to control the cloud or slow it down. So we got together and we thought about what we could do, and uh, we had two different strategies that happened in different parts of the organization. Um, oh, just real quickly, this is kind of what our finances looked like, and so you can imagine how scary this was of our actuals were supposed to say flat, and we were not doing that. So we piloted two different programs. One of them was a cost optimization program. So this was supposed to be like a one-year thing. And going back to what Jen said, this team really came in and focused immediately on the operate phase. And so they kind of did a little bit of whack-a-mole, like right size, shut things off, um, shut down accounts, buy a bunch of reservation instances, and come up with kind of a high-level mechanism for charging back. On the other side of the company, I was building a FinOps practice. We were starting in the inform phase. 
We needed to get accountability, figure out a chargeback structure that pushed it to the edge. We wanted to do a whole lot of training. We partnered with AWS. I think we were the first company to do the FinHacks. Um, and we wanted to get accountability to them by creating budget alerts. I'll say both of these programs and this FinOps function was very successful financially. It was a good year for us. However, what I was building was more of a practice. While the optimization program was a little bit like a prescription trying to fix a root problem, but wasn't really fixing the root problem. And what I mean by that is if you bring in a bunch of people to play whack-a-mole, when they leave, the bad habits consist, they stay. So what we knew is that the pro we needed to build something that was gonna be long-term, um, and so we decided to launch a global FinOps team that would be centralized. So how do we do this? We start with executive sponsor. Uh, this was pretty easy to do. We had already saved a lot of money, um, and so we had the respect of our VP and our uh, VP of Infrastructure and Operations, and we decided to build this global team sitting underneath our CIO organization, but we really had to have a dotted line to our finance organization and be partners in this. I always like to say, we talk oftentimes about FinOps about having real-time data, but a big role of our FinOps organization is to have real-time conversations. And that's what we do, is work with our engineering and our finance team to, to, levy, to have those conversations. The other thing we did is we looked inward for talent. Again, we're a learning company, right? We can learn this, we can do this. And so we looked at people that were in traditional roles of BI developers, maybe a program manager or a data analyst. We even brought in some automation engineers. And we kind of cre created this collection together um, and started figuring out how would we do this at scale. So immediately, um, to build this FinOps practice, we kind of had to figure out what was our objectives? What was our 30, 60, 90-day playbook? So we needed to first start out by defining our core competencies. Who were we and who were we not? Because that's a big question. Um, and to figure out a communication strategy. We did not want to be that group in an ivory tower telling people to right size. Um, so we wanted to figure out what was our communication and our education with the engineers. We also needed to figure out what our workflows are, what were going to be our inputs and our outputs and our delivery, and what were going to be our intersections with a CTO versus a CFO and versus an engineer that just started yesterday. We knew we also needed a lot of templates to track data. That way we could aggregate how we're doing, we could take our baselines, um, and also help with some consistency coming from our, our team. And lastly, we wanted to be very agile. Um, I think that's one of the things when people start a FinOps practice, they want to do it all and accomplish it all, and you just kind of got to start in one place and, and keep working on it over and over. And so that was an important part of who we wanted to be. So let me dive into this like a little bit more. So these were our core competencies to find, these nine core competencies. We did it three years ago and they still stand for us. So what we wanted to focus on was educating stakeholders. How do we do that? We had brown, brown lunches with folks. We brought in the fin hacks. Um, anytime there's a re-event or any announcements, we wrote blogs. We also did this cool thing of pairing people together. We maybe had someone that was really good at Spot and someone really good at Aurora Serverless and got them to work with each other. Focused a lot on cost optimization. It's not the most shiny thing, but we do the bill. Um, and so we wanted to figure out how to reduce toll on that so we weren't spending weeks trying to process it. Um, we also went ahead and um, partnered with CloudAbility to bring in a cloud financial management tool. This was allowed us really, really quickly to get our engineers real-time data. But when you have a tool like that, you also need to have a team that's administering it and, and working on pushing the new features out to the organization. And so we continue to, to manage that tool in-house. Um, we also wanted to work a lot on our forecasting. So if you can imagine, like I said, we have 300 different products. If they're all submitting their own forecast to finance, there's no consolidated view of our investment with AWS or any other cloud provider. So we came in to help support that, um, that relationship. Big thing for us was to get trusted relationships with teams. So we always put that at the forefront of anything that we're doing. Right away, we also came in and created a lot of governance, right? Like, you can't repurpose an account. This is the tax ID. This is the naming standard. We help drive a lot of those standards for consistency. We've moved more to like the opt-in things, like opt-in to clean up failed S3 multi-upload things. Um, reporting was a really big one, so we talk about a lot about real-time reporting, um, but there was a lot of other things that we needed to report. People want to report on their team, want to report on their products, want to report on their division, and so we do a lot of that. And I think the big heart of what we do is a data analyst. So we go in and we, um, we look at trends and variances and we put together these business cases that can get on the backlog of the SRE teams. And while we know they have a million priorities to do, um, we at least get the, that uh, analysis done and hand it over to them. 
We looked at our pricing strategy. What were we doing right? What were we doing wrong? How could we have done it better? Um, and we continue to improve that all the time. We probably buy RDS RIs weekly at this point. And lastly, we couldn't do any of this if we didn't automate and scale. So it was really important to partner with our engineering teams to do a lot of that work. Next thing I want to talk a little bit more about the workflows. And so, again, it was really important that we knew what was going to be an input and output and how was an engineer going to have to op operate with the FinOps team. So let me give an example. Um, love Cloud Abilities Anomaly Alerts. So what are we going to do when they trigger? Well, we have them automatically trigger to create a JIRA ticket. They can get them handed off to an SRE team's backlog, and they can, in real time, say, this is something I need to take action on. This is a true anomaly alert. Or, in real time, say, no, I'm doing this big performance testing. I scaled this up. Just ignore this. So they can pass that data back to us, and then we can aggregate that up and figure out this past year, you know, we've had 94 anomaly alerts, 60% of them were actionable, 40% um, of them, you know, we could ignore. The ones that were actionable, we avoided, you know, $100,000. $100, Another big thing for us was tracking via templates. Another great uh, advice I got from the Cloudability team was building these business cases. Um, and so this really allowed us, again, in JIRA, to capture a snapshot in time, a recommendation that's being made, and allowed it to get on that, that, that SRE team's backlog. And then again, we could track those metrics to aggregate them up or down. We have other templates around when buying RIs, what is the return on investments. We got our templates for forecasting, so we have consistency across all of our businesses as well. While we're doing all of this, I keep mentioning that we're kind of trying to refine and improve our playbook. So I'll give you another example of this. When we first did budget alerts, we were in the crawl phase. And what I mean by that is we would go into AWS, we'd manually create the budget alert, and it would email us. And then we would go ahead and reach out to an engineer. You can't do that when you have 800 accounts. So we've had to do a lot of automation where we now take our forecasts, we automatically load it into budget alerts, they automatically flow right out to that engineer team, and we also have a budget, a budget dashboard created that tells us the worst offenders, who's been going over three months consistently, so we know who to follow up with. We're ready to take that to the running stage next. We want to have these pushing um, uh, out to Slack, like get it into the Slack channels that the teams are already working in. And instead of just kind of the traditional email, can we improve it with SSM and customize it to actually give them the trusted advisor recommendations right away? So this is a really good example where sometimes you just got to start and then keep iterating your processes. By doing all of that, um, we were able to kind of turn our actuals down <laughs> for the first time in a long time. A lot of it was... Th through the cost savings activities, getting teams to right size, then turn things off on weekends, um, you know, finding accounts that weren't really being used and shutting them off. So there was a lot of big wins. Another big win for us is we were able to improve our forecasting because we knew who to talk to, we knew how to forecast with, we knew when the anomaly alerts were happening for the first time and could go reach out to people. Um, I could stand up here and literally tell you 50 some stories of products that we've cut the cost in half or um, products that we have migrated and then three months later uh, fixed, and, and, and again, it's running like less than 20% of what it did in the data center. And those are really cool stories. And my executives like to hear those stories. But what's more important to me is when I get an engineer that messaged me on Slack and he says, Ashley, I got into CloudAbility today, I found a, data, a RDS instance that's running, it's $1,000 a month, I just shut it off. That's a win for me. Because that means we're really, really changing the culture and the way that engineers are thinking about costs on a daily basis. Um, last thing I want to leave you with is I don't think I would be where I am today without the foundation. I joined as maybe member number 30 or something like that, and we're at over 4,000 members. And it's just been an amazing community. Um, a lot of friendships have been made, but most importantly, discoveries on how we should be doing best practices. Um, so really, really encourage, if you're interested in this topic, to go out to FinOps.org. I've been leading a group called Adopting FinOps for the last four months. We meet on Fridays with people all over the globe. And what we've done together is kind of put together a playbook. If I could have gone back in time three years ago, how would have I want to build a, a FinOps organization? This uh, roadmap up here is only an example. It's got an entire white paper behind it. Um, we've got some persona baseball cards. So how would you talk to a CTO about FinOps versus how would you talk to a VP of engineer? Um, we've also built some racy daisy charts, and we continue to build out the material on that. And so I love that about the FinOps community because we can, we can bring a collective energy and thoughts from around the world and, and deliver you know, free material um, to the public. Um, so with that said, I think I'm going to hand it over to Eugene. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about quality and other customers that are using um, FinOps practice. 
session. All right, back up here. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much, Ashley. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the overview of what FinOps is and how it can actually be put into practice. I'm going to spend just a few minutes uh, digging a little bit deeper into that, talking about what are the actual pieces of the CloudAbility suite of products that allow you to accelerate the development of your own FinOps practice. I know I'm standing between you and the bar and or dinner, so I'll make sure to be concise. Um, so let's just reground ourselves. Uh, Jen and Ashley both mentioned FinOps, inform, optimize, operate. It's, it's a continuous process that needs to happen continuously every day, every week, every month. There is no single silver bullet, one-time thing that you can do that will allow you to get the most out of your cloud spend for the fullness of time. Oftentimes, um, we get asked, what are the KPIs that I need to set? Or what, how do I measure this success? Ashley just talked about a few that she uses. The most important thing that we tell folks is you have to start with somewhere and something. You have to create your key performance indicators just like every other area of your organization creates them. Those might be uh, RI or savings plan utilization or coverage, might be savings realized versus potential savings, things of that nature. And you'll continue to enhance those KPIs. You'll get new ones and we'll talk about how you do that. But one of the most important things is starting in that inform phase as uh, Ashley just mentioned, because it's very important to understand how much you are spending as a consumer of these cloud services so that you can own those costs and do something about them. So uh, one of the things we're going to talk about today is the Cloud Bill of Suite of Products, but we're also going to talk about some of the trends we see and some things that we hear from our customers and even the uh, practitioners in the community about how it's not just cloud spend, it's not just what my teams are consuming from AWS, but it's starting to be more than that because those teams are starting to consume other IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS products, Snowflake, Datadog, and a lot of the folks that are out there. And those are also consumption-based costs that come in very frequently, and you need to be able to allocate and view those so you can own those costs as well, and subsequently optimize those costs and put that into your operating model. So, Really quickly, what are some best practices that, that our customers have put into place? Um, the first two kind of go hand in hand, right? We talk about near real-time visibility of all spend. I really like Ashley's comment. It's about real-time conversations, and that has to ha can happen only if you have accurate visibility into your costs as a consumer of these um, services. So it has to be based on that actual consumption. You have to be able to allocate all of those costs that are coming in. You also want to get to what we've called unit economics, or the community calls unit economics, because that is a better context for your cloud costs. Your, your costs might be going up, but is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? If your business is growing and you're a ride-sharing company who's doing more rides, or you're a learning company who is educating more people, that might be a good thing. You want to put it into the context of that cost. Finally, budgeting, tracking your spend, forecasting. Very difficult to do. 8% uh, is pretty impressive, but uh, you want to make sure you're, you're measuring how you're doing against those budgets that your teams have set. Uh, you want to get to a, a healthy usage of commitment-based discount products. Now, this, this is a pretty wide range, 80 to 95%, but that is by design. Some organizations have different risk tolerances in terms of your commitments to certain vendors or providers. But you want to make sure you're taking advantage of those because there's tremendous savings opportunities available for you there. And finally, it's the automation of those resources that you're not using, shutting them down, terminating, right-sizing. That is critical, but it's, it's not something that you can get as much value out of if you're doing it one at a time or not in an automated fashion, so finding ways to automate it, like workflows. So we'll dive in and we'll talk about how does AppDO and the CloudAbility suite of products allow you to do that. I think I broke the clicker. Okay, so the inform phase. It's all about informing your consumers or internal constituents of what they're spending, how much they're spending, and where they're spending it. So having that cost allocation strategy, inclusive of any custom pricing or discounts that you might have, again, it has to be accurate, is critical, so that you can do those show back, charge back, depending on where you're at and, where you are at and what you do within your organization and then establish those benchmarks. So how, do you, how does CloudAbility help you do that? Well, 
fundamental, and we haven't quite dug into this too much, but the FinOps community really digs into it, is, is tagging. Having a good tagging strategy is absolutely critical. I'm sure many, if not all of you here, are faced with that and are doing that already. But it, it's not a perfect strategy, because no matter how good your process is, there's always two problems. One is, is governance, right? You have to be able to uh, tag everything, and you have to make sure that everybody tags appropriately. And the second is there's human error involved, right? Tags by design are freeform, which means somebody might type uh, team A with a capital T, lowercase t. Those are different tags. So what Cloudability allows you to do is using uh, an area called business mappings, you create your own custom dimensions, synthetic tags, if you will, based on rules that you create. It could be based on the uh, AWS tags. It could be other data that you bring in, and that automatically allocates those costs to the proper entity and allows you to allocate 100% of those costs. So that's one very important uh, way, and it's probably one of our most used features. The second area is cloudability views. And so uh, what we hear often is, well, I've allocated my cost. Team Ashley has this much cost, but I want Ashley to only see her team's cost when she accesses cloudability. Well, you can do that with cloudability views. Finally, there's unit economics. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this later on because it's, it is uh, probably in more the walk or run phase. But getting to that cost that is in the context of your business, cost per insurance claim process, for example, if you're a uh, insurance company, that allows you to become much more effective in the way you deploy your finance practices. This is the one everybody gets excited about, the optimized phase. This is where you get to save money, right? Well, it's not just about saving money. It's about getting the most you possibly can out of your cloud spend. Yes, it's exciting to be able to say you saved $15 million. That's amazing. But you want to also be able to make that sustainable. So detecting anomalies, anomalous usage and the associated spend with it, that's something that Cloudability does automatically. But we also identify opportunities for you to save money via termination of idle and over-provisioned resources, not just compute, but also RDS, S3, uh, Redshift even. Those are areas that are often overlooked in terms of where you can save a tremendous amount of money. And finally, we also provide, actually as of two weeks ago, and I think if you were in the crowd, just released this and built this, so kudos, uh, our own savings plans recommendations, which are complete with a financial picture. Uh, they also actually, if you do have convertible RIs or still have those, we will make the modification recommendations and then the savings plan purchase recommendations as opposed so that you get your maximum value out of your convertible RIs. And you also get that business case, if you will, of your recommendations and why you should commit to this amount of spend with the associated underlying data so you can convince whomever it is that you need to convince that you should make this purchase, make this commitment. Now you get to the operate phase, and this to me is where it really gets exciting. You start to see that flywheel spinning, you start to see turning, right? So don't let the excitement of the optimized phase overshadow the operate phase. This is where you can start to really get that full force multiplier effect and start to automate practices. Things like automating um, on off or start stop for EC2 instances, creating policies for um, terminating idle or orphaned, if you will, EBS instances. Those are resources. Those are all available in Cloudability. They're fantastic. But one of the things I'm most excited about is the team released about three, four months ago, well, you know, we listened to Ashley and others, um, an integration with JIRA. You can now create policies that will automatically push recommendations to the correct individuals at the right time, depending on what cadence you set it at, so that they can action it within JIRA and it's a bi-directional integration. So this is really exciting because you can see what's actioned or what's not, and if not, why not? And then whatever is actioned, we will calculate for you the ROI, the savings that you have realized, or your organization has realized, from those right sizing recommendations. This also was influenced by the FinOps community because I, Jay might have to keep me honest on this, but I think the most important or the biggest challenge that the community was facing when we did the state of FinOps survey was getting engineers to take action. And when we got the testimonials, it wasn't because engineers are nefarious people who don't want to save the customers money or that save the company money. It's because they're very busy. 
And you have to not only go to where they are, but you also have to bring the data to support or refute a recommendation. So that's what we did. We're continuing to enhance that. We're starting to see a lot of usage there and a lot of power coming out of that in the past three, four months since we've launched it. So a couple more slides before we get to the live Q&A session. I I've talked about the cloudability suite of products. That's also a particular point of pride, pride for me. I stand on the shoulders of giants. The team is amazing at building this. If you were in this room a year ago, I guess you wouldn't be in this room, it'd be virtual, but we, there wouldn't be a suite of products. It was just cloudability. So what is the cloudability suite? Well, we still have cloudability. We still invest in it uh, to a tremendous degree. But the team has also, in the past six to nine months, launched Cloudability Shift, which allows you to plan and model out migrations from data centers or other on-prem uh, environments, hybrid or otherwise, into the cloud. And then once you land on a plan, you can actually track through, via integration with Cloudability, the progress of that plan, which invariably, there's you know, stops and starts or hiccups and things that change, and you get to model that out. We also launched Cloudability SaaS. I think Jen alluded to it. Um, this phenomenon of de uh, decentralized procurement, it's not just uh, in AWS. Many are uh, mirroring that model, Snowflake, Datadog, uh, Cloudflare, others, where an engineer who has access to a keyboard can actually commit the company to uh, various different costs, buy licenses, product managers on my team can buy balsamic licenses, and we're on the hook to pay for those. Well, Cloudability SaaS, via a very similar process that Cloudability follows, meaning integration with uh, a few providers, for example, your SSO provider, will immediately show you the entire list of applications that your organization has, what the associated costs are there, who's responsible for those costs, allows you to model that, and also provides you optimization recommendations for unused licenses, as an example, downsizing licenses in some vendor examples of that nature. Finally, Cloudability Total Cost, we're really excited to preview now, allows you to pull in and complete that thought that I talked about earlier, non-cloud direct costs, meaning you can actually bring in uh, G Suite costs, uh, O365, uh, Okta, uh, Snowflake, uh, Datadog, Cloudflare, et cetera. Model those and allocate those via the same uh, business mappings that you've created to the correct individuals or teams or products or business units, what have you, and have that visibility and get a total cost of the cloud and associated services that your teams consume in order to build the applications and the products that your company uses. So it is an evolving suite. We continue to grow it, and I'm really excited for that. Oh, I do have to uh, mention, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I've been uh, doing a little bit of a harbor cruise, but come by the booth. There's a lot of great individuals there who will show you the full depth of the iceberg, demos, swag, t-shirts. We'd love to have you. It's booth 869. I think I got that right. I see some nods. Uh, so come by. We'd love to see you. And, oh, and we, there's some resources here. Uh, for you to learn more, you all uh, should have gotten a uh, FinOps ebook on your chairs. Uh, we also have FinOps Fridays and other sessions hosted by Nathan Besh, who I think actually snuck out, and I'm going to have to talk to him about that later. Um, but there's also, last but certainly not least, the FinOps Foundation website. Get involved in the community. Cloudability customer or otherwise, it, it's a great place to share information, share knowledge. There's a Slack workspace where there's a ton of activity going on. It's really a great place to, to get started, get better, and get the most out of your cloud spend. So I think that's it. And we are, we've got about 16, 17 minutes to live Q&A. Um, let us know if you have any questions. And thank you so much for listening to us. Gentleman in the middle there. The shared resources. Um, there are different. Um, we have different uh, techniques that you can do for shared cost, including Kubernetes too. So is it ECT? Is it EC2 or is it Kubernetes? EKS. Um, yeah, so I personally haven't done the EKS solution yet. Um, I don't know if you have done the EKS solution, but there is a whole Slack channel regarding EKS and um, the distribution of services. It is one of the bigger challenges 
um, with, uh, with the, the shared environments. In the FinOps work. In the FinOps that. Foundation, yes. And I'll jump in there as well. So the question um, is, what do you do with container costs, right? Because there's shared resources that um, those containers run on. Uh, it is a challenge. It's definitely one of those, uh, I'd say, walk or run areas. Yep. Cloudability actually provides you a cloud co uh, container cost management uh, feature set, an entire area, where we allow you to automate the allocation of uh, your shared resource costs to things like namespaces or labels. Uh, whether you're running a managed Kubernetes service through one of the cloud providers or you're rolling your own, um, it's as simple as setting up. It, it is an agent-based system where we collect the utilization metrics of the underlying resources, and then you can then create the rules by which you allocate the costs of those shared resources. You can also then allocate off-cluster resources, like if you're running a database that supports the uh, workloads that you have in your containerized environment. So it's really pretty advanced. It's pretty darn cool. Um, but it is something that folks are, are faced with more and more. I think the last stat I saw is by 2025, over 85% of workloads will be containerized in some fashion. So uh, it's an important area and a great question. Cool. Any other questions? Right here in the front, although I'm kind of blinded, so I'm not sure if you're actually raising your hand. Yeah, so this is a service that AWS offers. You can ask your TAM about it. Um, and we did it in person, but now we do them virtually. Um, but they come up with like a four hour working session um, where it's real hands on experience. They get into their own accounts, the engineer teams, and go through activities to learn about Cost Explorer and how they can optimize. And sometimes we walk out of that session and people have cleaned a lot of stuff, things, shut them off. They do a lot on spot training as well. Um, so just ask your TAM about them. Um, the whole team that offers it, it's, it's amazing. I think you get like swag with it too, so that's cool. <laughs> it's called FinHack. Sorry, yeah, I'll repeat that. How can you how can you learn about FinHacks? Um, that's a ser uh, I guess a service offered by AWS. I, I believe it's free too, so check it out. All right. Any other questions? Over there on the left hand side. We have looked at it, so with Fidelity, we have looked at various different types of life cycles. And to your point, you know, one of the things that um, you long running life, long running instances usually is not, not a best practice that you actually want to see. And so looking at, you know, how long the instance has been running, not only that, but things like um, what type of instance it is too, because there is also things, you know, like if you've got running an older engine, if you just switch to a newer engine, too, by the way, you get usually better performance and you also get a, um, it at reduced rates. Um, and so we, you do have the ability through, through CloudAbility and through the data that you're getting to, talk, to look at and start to make it do analysis on the length of, why, uh, of those instances and those life cycles. Yeah, I'll just add, we've kind of built some custom reports, especially when we're looking at like getting people off of previous generations. Um, we'll create some reports to show, you know, what are the teams that are like the worst offenders of, of, of that type of activity. We do the same thing with uh, longest running instances too. Yes. Um, so one of the, from the FinOps perspective, you are not allowed to actually talk about your um, agreements with the, the various providers. That is one of the rules of the, the foundation itself. However, based uh, what we do talk about, though, is other types of opportunities and the fact that you should be in negotiations with your cloud service provider. Some people don't know that that is an option. Um, and also then the, the purchases that you can make, either through savings plan, advanced reserved instance purchases, and, and other ways that you can negotiate um, with the providers in order to get better rates. Yeah, and I'll provide an example too. One, one thing I love about the foundation is um, I was trying to convince our executive team to move more with three-year savings plans. And so I was able just to ping a few people to ask, yeah. you know, what, what percentage do you do on one year versus three year? And are they all up front? And so we were able to get some benchmark data um, that I could take back that helped influence influenced our move. So there's a lot of those conversations happening. The, the state of FinOps survey is a really great one. It's yeah, where I got that number of benchmarking myself against how other organizations are doing forecasting. Yeah, so once, I'm um, just to add on that, once a year we do a state of the FinOps survey 
um, and it's actually open right now. And so if you become a, a practitioner, you can participate in the survey. Um, I think we've already had over 1,000 people actually answer the 2022. And this allows us to identify the areas where you're having challenges, and then it sets the agenda for the next year. So last year, we heard about the shared environments. We heard about being able to get engineers to take action, and so we created working groups and SIGs in order to address those areas and get content. And so you really start to be able to participate in the community and see what other groups are doing in order to have those challenges. I saw another question. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, my favorite, my favorite things. I actually think there's purposes for, for both spots and for reserved instances. So we, we have a really high percentage of um, coverage for reserved instances um, in, in our company. But um, in my organization itself, we actually utilize spot quite a bit in our um, non-production environments. Um, and when we started to first look at utilizing spot, we asked the question, you know, what should we be what should be the target of spot? And, and we were told, I think, about 10% is usually what companies are able to get at. Um, by utilizing spot and integrating it into the pipelines in our um, non-prod environments, we were actually able to launch 56% of our compute in spot itself. And this is, this is a good counterbalance for a couple of different reasons. When, when, with reserved instances, when you purchase them, they're 24 by 7, right? And that is, that is great for a lot of workloads. Um, but with spot instances, if you have variable workloads, um, they, that helps you reduce the overall cost. The other thing, reason we use it is to, um, to actually test resiliency of the environment, right? So why wouldn't you use spot? Because spot can be taken away from you for, with the two minutes notice, right? Um, and you also, there could be, when you go to launch spot, they could be not available in some availability zones and that, and so it takes some management in order to do it right. Um, but, um, but utilizing, you know, taking both of those and bringing them together really gives you the best of both benefits. Um, and in spot, you know, you could get up to 70 to 80 percent reductions. We normally see more like 50 to 60 percent cost reductions for spot, which is comparable to reserve instances, to be honest. Um, but the resiliency thing, because if the spot gets taken away from you, you now know how your application is going to react if it actually gets taken away from you in an avail availability zone. Um, so so there, are, there are good purposes for both. Okay. So the one, the, the only thing that can't be shared, right, is your negotiated rates with the cloud service providers. We ask that. Well, do you, mean, you know, do you mean within the FinOps community or within your organization sharing? The price? Oh, with your organization, um, we we don't. We don't really announce what our, ours is. You, you know, there, there, I guess there are ways to infer it, but um, usually, you know, uh, I would, would look at your procurement group to make sure that you know what the legal, um, what the legality is about talking about it, even within your organization. Yeah, we share, um, and I'm sure that you do some, we share percentage of discounts that we have received overall, and it's a combined in, that it's a combined metric that includes that discount, but it also includes reserved instance purchases and it includes spot instances too. And so um, that is, that's the metric we go through and, and the one that's probably more important. To we have to share that information with our solutions architects that are coming up with designs and getting those in initial quotes too as well. I think there's, uh, from the broad set of customers, there's uh, an additional reason besides just procurement, which is the fully discounted rate and associated cost, that can vary, right, if an RI applies or doesn't, and that floats unless you have that turned off in AWS, uh, which means that a team can get hit with, with a surprise, uh, a surprise spike in costs or a decrease, and it, it's, it's highly variable from that perspective. 
it's showing either the public rate or in Cloud Ability, you actually create your own custom rate and apply it as a business metric. The same way you create a rule that says, calculate my cost per ride completed, you can create uh, your custom rate, and that's kind of the rate you show uh, externally or externally to your uh, FinOps internal. practice or uh, to your internal constituents, but external to your FinOps practice. That also, uh, we've seen organizations who have the added benefit of doing that and being transparent with it, right? We, this is the rate for this, for that, for these SKUs. Um, it includes a, a, an internal upcharge that funds the um, FinOps practice because it becomes a self-funding internal team uh, from a, a financial chargeback perspective. Yeah, I can maybe take that one to start with. So we did do a lot of show back, um, and a lot of our stuff was being funded from a central organization, but we're moving that to needing to charge it back to the businesses. And so we've shifted to a more granular charge back at the application level. But having some of those conversations about you know, something like cloud custodian config that was built by a centralized team, who pays for that? And so we've had to go through some of those conversations that um, you know, they rightfully are part of building something in the cloud, so they should be packaged together as a charge back to the product that's developing. Yeah. So, a lot of people will start with show back and then move into the charge back models um, if your organization you know, pushes in that direction. Um, but you, you're completely right about the, the combined costs are really important to, to look at too. Oh. Question in the back? Oh, so do you, is the question, uh, do, do you, either the organizations kind of curate the resources or services that are available to the, the developers internally, and does, is that managed by the FinOps organization? I, I would, so with Fidelity, at the beginning, we actually, um, because of reserved instance, so there's been a lot of evolution in the optimization tools that AWS and Azure has, you know, and, and Google has offered. So at the beginning, when you were purchasing reserved instances, they were not over, they didn't float very well. They, you had to manage them, and they were very specific to availability zones or actually specific engine types. And because of that, we did try to manage the type of services and um, engines and things like that so that we could get proper coverage. Um, but with the savings plans and other type of things now, there's, there's not the need to necessarily do that. And so we, we actually try as a FinOps organization not to tell groups to use technology or not to use technology. It's about having a good discussion with them and allowing them to make the choice based on performance, based on value, based on, on cost. Yeah, we're the same way. I'd say the one exception for us is the marketplace. Um, we've been heavily pulled into that as a FinOps team. Um, and so we'll be probably moving over to private marketplace here shortly where we will make a uh, curated catalog um, so we can manage that a little bit better. But you know, let the engineers make the decisions and the calls as long as they're you know, comfortable with their committing to if we do do uh, reservation purchases with them. You mean that so from a development for the automation as part of your overall costs? Um, we, we do not. Yeah, we, we do not. No, we don't. Our team is also centrally funded, and um, it's a service that we offer out to the businesses. Yeah. Um, we allow them to opt in and out of a lot of that stuff, too. There's some things that we've taken to our Cloud Governance Council, and we've gotten enough engineer leaderships to vote on. I give a you know, simple example is um, S3 multi-upload multi failures. Um, we were spending like $10,000 a month on just them sitting out there. We all agreed that we could write a cloud custodian policy to clean those up. We're down to 97 cents a month. So um, if we get enough agreement, we'll roll it out, but um, we don't charge for that, like the automation to do that. Uh, sure, gentlemen in the aisle, and then we'll move to the, the question.
So I would answer it in a couple of different ways. There are different organizations that that matters more to or not. So you actually have to talk about the tolerance of your organization and what it is from a innovation versus cost and spend, right? So some companies really need to control cost and spend. We see this very much in the government industries too because they have very set budgets that they have to, address, that they have to adhere to. And so they, will imp they would put budgets in place along with anomaly detections, right, that would, would show some of that. Um, where other, like, you know, startup companies and that are much more about the innovation and they don't want to limit the type of things that go in. And so that's the type of, you know, discussion that you should actually have with your company is what is the tolerance for innovation versus risk versus spend um, and then make appropriate, um, a, you know, appropriate changes to it. But cloudability and other sort of tools allows you to do budgeting. And, um, and then, of course, AWS allows you to restrict on certain accounts if you need to. I think we just got that one last question or time, but um, I am also happy to stay after. I don't know if Jen and Ashley's got a schedule, but go ahead. Um, so I, I wouldn't, uh, as a community, we do have discussions with them, but I would actually say it's the community, like Pearson has worked with AWS and these different group, uh, different, um, companies itself work with them and give them their set of requirements for it. Um, you know, I, I am always amazed at AWS and Azure about the difference in the model versus some of the, the legacy um, traditional IT providers, which where they have a mind toward optimization and savings and continual cost per unit reduction. Um, and so, you know, their, their products and services in that space has really expanded over the last three years. And so I, I think we can be influential as um, not a, just the foundation, but as members of the community itself, especially if you're coming in with a well thought out idea. Yeah, we're definitely louder together, yeah. as Eugene knows. <laughs> they definitely have an influence on our roadmap, so. Um, okay, I think, unless, is there that one question, or I'm getting the, okay, I'm getting the hook. The music's gonna start playing, it's like the Oscars. Uh, but again, we'll thank you around, all yeah. very much. Um, uh, thank you, Jen and Ashley, for sharing your insights, and hope you have a great uh, rest of your reInvent, folks. Thank you. Thanks.